nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. It's a, a real pleasure to introduce a, a Dr. Adam Hope from Thermocalc Software. Uh, we've been working with Thermocalc to make their academic version available in NanoHub for uh, quite a long time. And we're, we are, from NanoHub's standpoint, very thankful to Adam and his colleagues in Thermocalc for uh, uh, sharing their amazing tool through NanoHub. We, my group, uses it for research. We use it for uh, in the classroom, so we're very excited about having the tool available in NanoHub. Um, so, Adam is going to give us examples of using thermocalc to do thermodynamic calculations motivated by industry and giving us examples for how you can use it in the classroom and also in your own research. So, Adam got his PhD in welding engineering at the Ohio State University, and he's been uh, focusing on integrating computational tools and experimental uh, techniques uh, for uh, uh, weld cracking and um, to develop new weld materials and, and optimize compositions. Uh, you probably all know that this type of CALFAD tools are critical to design new alloys. And so his work in Thermocalc is um, focuses on providing training and advice to, to the various users. So we're very fortunate to have him present today. So Adam, thank you very much and take it away. Thanks Alejandro. Before I open my PowerPoint, uh, just make sure you can launch the tool if you do wanna follow along with us uh, I'm going to do a couple of in-class examples uh, live, and you can try to follow along. And if you want to do that, go to this address here, nanohub.org slash tools slash TC Academic. And if you've already registered and logged in, click Launch Tool. It should come up. If not, there's a little link down here to get access, and uh, you can follow those instructions there. And hopefully that, that won't take too long. But as Alejandro said, this stuff will be recorded, so you guys can check that out later. So today's talk is going to be about Integrated Computational Materials Engineering, ICME, in the classroom. Uh, and we want to highlight how we can teach uh, fundamental thermodynamics and kinetics um, using commercial tools like Thermocalc um, and coupled with uh, online simulation resources like NanoHub. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, ICME and Industry 4.0. I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with those concepts, so I won't spend too much time on that. And then I'll hit a little bit on the materials data challenge that we face, uh, and namely the lack of materials data in a lot of ways uh, as engineers. And then I'll dig into the CalFed approach and how that works and how Thermocalc works as a tool. And then I'm gonna show a couple of examples. So we'll talk a little bit about how Thermocalc uh, and CalFed tools can be used as a teaching tool. I'll give some uh, lesson ideas that you can use if you're an educator out there and you want to integrate uh, these kinds of things into your coursework. We have a couple of uh, resources for you for that. We'll do an example, relatively simple example for iron carbon phase diagram. And then I'll talk a little bit about how Thermocout can be used as a problem solving tool. We'll talk about solidification cracking and we'll do a little bit more advanced example uh, related to that. And then I'll kind of wrap up uh, showing a nice case study for additive manufacturing where um, CalFAD tools were integrated into a real ICME framework to solve an additive manufacturing problem. Okay, so you guys are probably pretty familiar with this uh, concept here of uh, ICME. We have this classic uh, relationship here that, that Greg Olson popularized uh, from composition processing structure properties to performance relationships. And what we do a lot of is deductive reasoning. So we go this way in the, uh, in the, in the relationships here where we know something about our composition and we decide something about our processing, or maybe we decide on our composition and we try to predict what structure will form microstructure, uh, and then try to 
know something about the properties based on that microstructure. What we'd really like to do is go the other way, inductive, where we say, what performance do we need in a particular part? Um, and drive backwards and determine exactly what chemistry and processing route will lead to the structure that will give us the properties we need. You can think of this a little bit like, and this is an industry 4.0 concept, about this topology optimization that's been used uh, quite a bit in the aerospace industry to reduce weight, where you have a part geometry uh, such as this one, and we use finite element modeling to optimize the structure to maybe minimize the weight, for example, and still maintain the, the maximum strength and you know reduce stress concentrators and things like that. And so you get these kind of like nice organic looking shapes that you might not design on your own as a, as a human, I guess. Um, and one thing I'd like to just, just highlight is what if this is, this is great. This here, this assumes that the properties of the material are the same everywhere, right? We have some material that's been chosen for this application and that those material properties go into creating this design. What if we could have location specific properties? What if we could have areas of the part that have higher strength, but maybe are a little bit less ductile and regions that have more ductility, but less strength? How would that change the part design? And to really do that, we need to be able to do this. And so making these jumps, we got to make these jumps from each of these, these things here uh, requires models. Right? We have models that describe uh, each of these jumps. Ones that you're probably most familiar with are properties to performance. That's finite element modeling fills this gap quite well. Um, structure property relationships get a little bit more tricky. Um, and composition process structure relationships, this is kind of where CalFed fits in. We are pretty good at predicting how composition and processing route will affect the, the microstructure of the materials. And so we need models at each step of the way. And I want to also point out that we need people. Uh, we need people from many disciplines, right? Material scientists are going to be down on this end. And then we need people like mechanical engineers over on this end. And we have to integrate across length scales and across people and across models. And, and at each step of the way, materials data is critical, right? So we need good materials data at each of these steps, right? We can't have a good FEM model if we don't have uh, good material data as an input to that model, right? And so what do you do if your chemistry or your process changes, right? You've already developed a finite element model, let's say, and the vendor for the material you're buying sends you a new heat that's got a slightly different chemistry. Is your finite element model still applicable? Okay, so we're talking about materials data and we're gonna try to, I'm gonna try to hammer home for you guys what the, the big challenges we have with materials data are in an ICME world. And one big thing is temperature dependence. And so you can go and find materials data in a lot of different places. One place you might look as a handbook, right? If you're gonna make a finite element model, let's say you're gonna make a model such as the one down here this is a um, additive build finite element model that is looking at a single node in the build plate. And the laser is rastering across melting material. And as the laser comes to our node that we're looking at, that node heats up, it melts, and then the laser moves on by and the material starts to cool and solidifies. Right? So this is a temperature versus time plot for a, a given node in this additive build. And we care about this because this ends up helping us determine things like residual stress distributions in the part, right? We need to know the thermal history at every location coupled with something like the CTE or the density to give us an idea of the residual stress buildup in that part. And so it's critical to get this simulation correct or right, if you will. And so if you're making this kind of simulation, you might go and say, oh, well, I need the specific heat. And so you go to the handbook and the handbook says, oh, for 316 L stainless steel, it's 0.5. And you go to the handbook and you say, I need the latent heat, right? Because we need to describe the solidification. And it just gives a single value along with the solidus temperature and the liquidus temperature. And so it's just a straight line. 
Now with a tool like CalFAD tools, we can calculate the specific heat and the latent heat as a function of temperature. And they definitely change as a function of temperature. In addition, we have segregation during the solidification process, which expands our solidification temperature range, as shown here, and changes the, the way the latent heat is distributed throughout the solidification process. So it's not just a straight line. In addition, what if your chemistry changes, right? What if this heat of 316 has a little bit less chrome and a little bit more carbon? How, how, might, that, how might that change these things? And so you can see it makes a big difference on the finite element model. If we just use the handbook values, we predict a really high peak temperature and a really short solidification time here and a faster cooling rate. And when we use the CalFAD values, we get a different peak temperature with a uh, wider solidification temperature range and slower cooling rate. And even, I talked about residual stress, but even this solidification time will affect the pool shape and the pool shape can have some implications on things like solidification cracking and, and stuff like that. And so uh, this just is to try to emphasize that the temperature dependence is, is very important here. And as I've already alluded to, chemistry is also important, right? We need to understand the chemistry effect. And when you're buying material or getting material from somewhere, it's going to have a chemistry spec range, right? And you may even specify your own spec range that's more narrow than, than what the, uh, like the ASTM spec, for example, has specified. Um, and properties change as a function of chemistry. And so one important property, just as an example here for a titanium alloy, this is a TIE 6242. In titanium alloys, we care about something called the beta transis. And if you're a steel person and not a titanium person, you can think of the beta transis as like the A3 temperature, where we have a uh, allotropic uh, crystal transformation, phase transformation, where we go from, in steels, we go from FCC to BCC, but in titanium, we go from BCC to HCP. And it's an important temperature because we can use that to our advantage to tailor the microstructure to get different properties, just like we do in steels. And that temperature varies as a function of chemistry. And so we can take the chemistry spec here and calculate the beta transis with a tool like thermocalc across this chemistry spec range. So we can generate like maybe a normal distribution of chemistries that fit in this spec range and then calculate the beta transis. And you can see there's a pretty big variation, almost 50 degrees Celsius uh, at the tails. Uh, and so it's possible that you could get a material that's in spec uh, but the beta transis is quite low and maybe your heat treatment, you know, was supposed to be below the beta transis, but now you're heat treating above the beta transis, for example. So that could be a problem. Okay, so this is, this kind of emphasizes the material data challenge that we have as engineers. Uh, we don't have a lot of data out there and more and more we are using models in, in our world that require big data. And so you can get data uh, via experiments. Uh, obviously that costs you money and time and you need more experience each time you have a new material or each time the chemistry changes. You can look in handbooks. We talked a little bit about the problems with that. Uh, handbooks also don't really capture the chemistry variation. It's just for, for 316L and it might not even say what the actual chemistry of that, that value that they're giving you is and it might not also be as a function of temperature. But we have some alternatives, right? We can simulate or estimate data, right? We could take the handbooks and try to make some regression analysis. We could do something like machine learning on data that we already have, or we could use some mechanistic or phenomenological models that are physics-based and try to um, try to simulate the data in a, in, a, in a better way. And so that's where CalFAD comes in. And so if you've not heard of CalFAD before, uh, it's actually been around since the, uh, the idea has been around since I think the seventies and CalFAD software was first developed in the eighties and CalFAD is sort of a acronym for calculation of phase diagrams. Uh, but it's so much more than phase diagrams uh, today. And essentially what we're doing is we develop something called a CalFAD database and we capture the composition temperature dependence of material behavior um, across binary and ternary systems. And so in the same way 
if you think about, here's a ternary diagram. This is a pretty neat, like, 3D projection of a ternary diagram. This ternary diagram is bounded by these three binaries. The AC, the CB, and the AB binaries bound are the extreme limits of this ternary system. In the same way, for a multi-component system, say an alloy with eight, ten elements, that system is really also bounded by all of the binaries and all of the ternaries that are possible in that system, right? So if you've got eight elements, you can think about all the permutations of, of binary and ternaries combinations there are, right? There's quite a, quite a few. And so you can think of that system as being bounded by all of those binaries and ternaries. And that's the CalFAD method. If we know, if we have good information about the behavior uh, of these binary and ternary systems, we can make prediction, pr predictions, excuse me, into a multi-component space uh, about the, uh, the behavior of the materials. And so how do we do that? We do that mostly through uh, the Gibbs free energy. And so these binary and ternary systems that make up the database, what we're really doing is we're assessing how does the Gibbs free energy change for these binary and ternary systems uh, as a function of chemistry and temperature. And so we, and we do that for each phase, right? So we have Gibbs curves for the liquid phase and Gibbs curves for the, all the different solid phases, et cetera. Now the CalFed technique has been extended into uh, more kind of simulations and properties. Uh, so in the kinetic space, we can also solve fixed laws and determine something about diffusion, right? And so we're numerically solving uh, fixed equations here. And to do that, we need to know something about the diffusivity. And so we have to have databases for diffusivity. Uh, it's actually, we have a database of something called mobilities. I don't have time to cover that in this, in this talk, but. And then we can also talk about precipitation. We can make simulations for precipitation behavior, which is very important for uh, materials that are precipitation strengthened. Um, and to do that, we're essentially solving a set of equations that deals with classical nucleation and growth. Uh, you can look up the Langer-Schwartz method, uh, and we use these Kapman-Wenger numerical approaches. But if you're familiar with the, the idea of the competition between the free energy of formation and the surface energy, right? If you want to form a precipitate, if that precipitate is stable, then it's a lower energy state to have that precipitate exist, right? And so the, the, the driving force for that goes as the radius cubed because it's a volume of precipitate that would like to form. And so that's our energy cost that we get back from forming the precipitate. But to form it, we have to form a surface, right? And to form a new interface costs us energy, right? And so that goes as the square of the radius. And so that's your classic, uh, your classic nucleation barrier, right? This is your R star you may have learned about if you took a course on that. And this is your delta G star here. And so we're solving that essentially. Uh, it's more detailed than what I can go into detail on in this, in this talk, but that's essentially what's going on. And more and more nowadays, we're, we're modeling other properties in a kind of CalFAD-like way, uh, such as resistivity, uh, that could be electrical or thermal, molar volume, density, antiphase boundary energy, uh, surface energy or, or, or uh, interfacial energy. We have models for, and other things like martensite, bainite, and perlite kinetics. Uh, and these can all be modeled in a kind of physics-based CalFed-like way, uh, which allows us to capture a really big composition space. Okay, and so as you may have already seen, as I, as I doodle on the page here and draw these kind of concepts that you, that you learn in your, in your typical material science uh, coursework, like this R star, delta G star, and you've seen fixed laws before if you've taken a diffusion course. This provides us a great opportunity to use CalFAD tools as a teaching tool. And so um, over here, I have the, the, the construction of a phase diagram by drawing the common tangents from the Gibbs curves. So with a tool like Thermocalc, we can plot the Gibbs curves for each phase. The green curve is the Gibbs curve for liquid, and the blue curve is the Gibbs curve for the solid phase. And you see there's a, there's a miscibility gap. There's 
There's two gamma phases. This is a copper silver system. And so I've just called this one gamma prime, but it's not actually ordered gamma prime like you would think of in a super alloy, but it's just another gamma, a silver rich gamma. And so you can see how you can draw the common tangents. And when you reach the eutectic point, you have one common tangent and so on. And so that makes it a great teaching tool, uh, not just for thermodynamics, but also for kinetics uh, and things like that as well. And so we don't have time to go over uh, all of these things today, but I would like to, to, to give you guys some free resources, whether you're a student and you want to learn more or whether you're uh, a teacher or a lecturer or, or an academic and you want to incorporate this in your, in your coursework. Uh, I just have some ideas for you here. Uh, the, the GIF that I just showed on the previous page is obviously one um, use that you, can, that you can use to help visualize. Um, I have a nice lecture on our learning hub. We have a learning hub at learn.thermocalc.com and it has a number of free lectures that are available uh, where me and my colleagues are, are going through some different concepts and showing you how to use the software. There's a really nice one on uh, stainless steels and the gamma loop. If you're familiar with stainless steels, you've probably heard of the gamma loop. It's in the iron chrome phase diagram. Um, you can do things like simulate Darkin's classic experiment, which is uh, uphill diffusion. And so you can explore why does uphill diffusion happen. Um, and there's a, there's a picture of that over here, and there's a, there's a nice lesson here. And we'll make the slides available in the, uh, in the download area of the Thermocalc group. So you guys can have these links. You don't need to try to write these down right now. Um, you can explore things like precipitation, like we just showed, and you can even get as detailed as looking at what's the effect of the precipitate shape uh, and transformation strain, right? Some precipitates don't form as spheres, but they form as needles or plates. Uh, and the reason for that has got to do sometimes with transformation strain, and uh, it's easier to grow in one direction than another. And so you can actually simulate that with, uh, with thermocalc. And what we're gonna do um, is an in-class example of uh, iron carbon binary phase diagram, and we're gonna add some nickel to it. So we're gonna make a pseudo binary or what you might call an isopolethal section of the iron carbon system where we've added a fixed amount of nickel. And a couple of concepts we're gonna demonstrate with this is stable versus metastable phases, and just generally how to interpret uh, isopolethal sections. Okay, so at this point, we're going to transition over to the tool on NanoHub. Uh, I'd just like to mention that, Nano, that the Thermocalc academic version has been available since March on NanoHub. It's pretty, pretty new. It runs in the cloud on their servers. If you haven't run it yet, uh, it's kind of like a remote desktop. You can think of it that way to a, to a uh, Linux distribution that has Thermocalc installed on it. Um, and the, the academic version is essentially fully functional, except they're two major restrictions. You can only use three elements at a time, and there's a limitation on the databases. So you can only use the, the demo databases, which have a limited number of elements. And so right now, go ahead and navigate to nanohub.org slash tools slash TC academic. And I will do the same. Okay, so when you get there, click launch tool. And if you aren't logged in, it'll ask you about logging in. And uh, when you first load it, what I always like to do is depends on your monitor size. It loads at kind of a small resolution. If you have a big monitor or widescreen, you can drag this little box in the bottom right to fill your screen, get a little bit more real estate. To work with here. Um, this is the interface. I'm a little bit shorter on time than I anticipated at this moment, so I won't do a full walk through the interface uh, as I'd hoped, but uh, hopefully it's, it's not too hard to figure out. You can move these windows around, I'll just say, uh, like the results window and the project window. What we're going to do is click on phase diagram, okay? And these templates here give you like an easy starting point to set up a calculation. And so that'll set us up a system definer, a calculator, and a plot renderer. 
And so you can think of it as three steps. We set up a system, we decide what we want to calculate with that system, and then we display the results in some way, right? And so we will choose iron and carbon. Let's first just make the iron carbon phase diagram. So just select those two elements. We don't need to enter any carbon composition because we're going to vary carbon on the x-axis. So it doesn't really matter what that is. Then we'll click the equilibrium calculator in the project window over here on the left. And you'll see it's already set up for phase diagram. And just check the axes here to make sure that's right. Carbon and temperature. Yes, that's what we want to calculate. And I'm just going to change to Celsius. I'm a Celsius guy. You can calculate it whatever you want. Uh, so we'll go 500 to 3000 Celsius. That's that's fine. And 0 to 100 carbon is also fine. And then we'll click Perform Tree. And this will take a minute or so to run. It doesn't take too long for the, for the pure binary. Once we add a third element, it'll take a little bit longer. And then the result pops up over here on the right. We'll click the Plot Renderer on the left. And I apologize if I'm going a little too fast for you. This, as we said, the recording will be posted here. So you can you can do it again at your own pace if you are falling behind. And when we click the plot render, we get the variables here. We see that the uh, x-axis is carbon and the y is temperature. I will just change to Celsius. And what we're going to do is not plot against the entire carbon range, right? We don't need, we're not going to have an alloy with more than 10 weight percent carbon. So let's just cut that down from 0 to 10 with a step size of 1. And then click Perform. That'll let us kind of zoom in on the diagram. You can also zoom in by drawing on the diagram with the mouse like this. Right? So we see that here. This is our standard iron carbon phase diagram. Now, if we take a look at it real quick, we've got BCC plus graphite down here at the bottom. But I thought the iron carbon phase diagram was cementite. So what's going on with that? Well, graphite's the stable phase of carbon. And actually, most steels that have uh, a little bit of carbon in them that form cementite, that's a metastable, it's a metastable phase, even though it probably is never going to change to graphite, even if you hold it at 500C for a million years. I don't know, maybe it will. So what we need to do is we need to make a metastable calculation. And so what we're going to do is go to the System Definer, click on the Phases tab. And here's the phases that are involved in this iron carbon system. We need to uncheck graphite. So that tells Thermocalc, don't even consider the Gibbs free energy curve for graphite. Uh, I, don't, I don't want you to consider it at all. And preemptively, I'm going to just tell you to uncheck the diamond phase, uh, just in the interest of time. Diamond is actually the next stable form of carbon over cementite in iron carbon system. Uh, if you could make diamonds form in uh, low carbon steels, you'd probably be really rich. But that's not going to form kinetically. It's not favorable. So we'll uncheck both of those, and then we'll just click Perform again. And that'll recalculate the diagram with graphite and diamond kind of ignored, suspended, you can say. And now we see we have cementite, cementite plus BCC. And this is our standard iron carbon phase diagram. Now we want to add some nickel. We want to see how does nickel change this diagram. So what we'll do is we'll right click on the system definer and we'll click clone tree. And after we clone the tree, we'll just get an exact copy of what we've done over here as another tree here and we're going to just go to the system definer on the second one and add nickel and let's just add two weight percent nickel so go to the equilibrium calculator page just to double check that the axes are right when you add another element sometimes the axes get changed around on you so it actually changed for me it changed to nickel so change it back to carbon because we want to make the iron carbon phase diagram with 2% fixed nickel, not the other way around. So carbon's going to vary. Iron is the balance element. It's grayed out. So nickel is going to be fixed at 2 weight percent everywhere. Then you can go ahead and click Perform. 
and let it calculate. And everything gets carried over. Graphite's already suspended. Diamond phase is already suspended because we cloned it. So it was exactly the same. And you notice it takes a little bit longer. And then the diagram comes up. You don't see the tie lines anymore. In the previous one, we had these green tie lines. Uh, because the tie lines don't lie in the plane of this calculation because it's a like an arbitrary isoplethal section. So you can see the general shape is the same. You can do things like right click and hit add label. You can add some labels just to make it a little bit easier to see what's going on. Um, one neat thing I would like to say is if you right click and hit add label and you click show details, that actually loads a single point what we call a single point calculation right where you click the mouse. And so you can see that I click the mouse here at about 600 C and point almost one weight percent carbon. And it shows you the phase balance. So you may be familiar with the lever rule for a binary phase diagram so that you can figure out the volume fraction or the mass fraction of each phase and the chemistry of each phase. The lever rule doesn't work when you've got more than two elements. And so when you right click, it shows you the exact volume fraction of phases and the chemistry of the phases. So the cementite, cementite is Fe3C. When there's nickel, a little bit of nickel goes in the cementite. So if you were to have other elements like chrome and things like that, those could go in the cementite and sit on those lattice sites in the cementite crystal structure. And so it shows you here how much nickel is going in and what the composition of the BCC is. Okay, and the last thing I'll point out is you can just flip back and forth and look at the two diagrams and you see that the austenite uh, region is dropped, the FCC region gets dropped down a little bit and that's because uh, nickel is an austenite stabilizer, right? So it's expanding that FCC phase field. Okay, so I think that's a neat example um, that, you can, that you can use. You can explore different changes in chemistry. You could Instead of nickel, you could try chrome or manganese. You could try different amounts and see how that affects the iron carbon phase diagram. It's a nice exercise. Okay, so we'll shift gears back here to the PowerPoint. And so now I want to talk a little bit about how we can use these kinds of tools as a problem solving tool. So not really in an ICME kind of framework, but just simply day-to-day -day decision making problem solving uh, and that's got to do with solidification cracking i have a welding engineering degree from ohio state university and so i de dealt with a lot of uh, weld cracking phenomenon and solidification cracking is is one of them um, and solidification cracking quickly can't go into the, the detailed theories uh, deals with liquid films that are present at solidification grain boundaries they get pulled apart by strain and a lot of the, de the theories have to deal with the nature of that last liquid to solidify. How much liquid do we have at the grain boundary and, and things like that. Um, it can occur in any solidification process. Uh, it's maybe not very common in planar growth, but as long as you've got dendritic or cellular solidification, doesn't matter if it's a slow cooling rate like casting or a fast cooling rate like additive, you can get solidification cracking depending on the the conditions uh, like stress and chemistry and to, to really model this we need to understand non-equilibrium solidification right so we know about equilibrium solidification but in all of these casting welding additive processes we don't have equilibrium solidification we have very much non-equilibrium solidification and so can we predict crack susceptibility up front like before we make a weld or can we understand something about the materials which materials we should select so I think this is another nice uh, learning opportunity type case study to go through, especially in the classroom. Um, and so real quick, we're going to walk through uh, just briefly the derivation of what's called the Scheil equation or the Scheil Gulliver equation. You may have heard of that before. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about solidification. Um, equilibrium solidification, if we consider we have an alloy at 2.5 weight percent copper, 
here. Um, the solidification temperature range is 660 to 600, right? 650 to 600, 50 degrees C. And what do we solidify as? We solidify as FCC, single phase, no beta, no eutectic, nothing, right? That's what this says if we have equilibrium solidification. If you took a 2.5 weight percent copper alloy and cast it, you would see not single phase, guaranteed. Um, and so the reason for that is because we have non-equilibrium solidification, right? So let's make some assumptions about uh, our solidification. If we're cooling at some kind of moderate rate, like casting or welding, we can say that because the liquid has a really high diffusivity and also the liquid is probably moving around due to convection, that the diffusion rate in the liquid is infinitely fast for our purposes. It's a pretty good assumption. And as long as the cooling rate isn't super, super slow, let's say it's one degree C per second or 10 or 100 degrees C per second, something like that, that the time it takes us to first solidify once we form solid, the diffusion in the solid is basically negligible, right? We don't have enough time for any appreciable diffusion if we're just talking about spending 10 or 20 seconds at 5, 600 C. Okay, so let's, with those assumptions, trace out how we think solidification would proceed in the binary system, right? So we're cooling down, cooling down, and we hit the liquidus, right? Now we're in a two-phase, let's cool down one C below the liquidus. Now we're in a two-phase region. And in a two-phase region, you can draw the tie line. The solid will have this chemistry, and the liquid will have this chemistry, all right? The solid is now fixed. This solid is gonna have this chemistry, this, whatever this copper is, 1% or whatever, and that's not gonna change for the rest of the solidification process. All of our liquid, all of our remaining liquid, after solidifying a little bit of solid, now has this chemistry, right? The solid has less copper than the overall alloy chemistry, so the liquid must have more, right? That's described by this tie line. And so now we have a whole pool of liquid with this chemistry, and so let's solidify that. Let's cool down one degree, and the new solid has this chemistry, and the new liquid has this chemistry. And we do it again, cooling down the next bit of solid. So I'm just solidifying a little bit at a time, some small fraction solid, let's say. And we have this solid, and now we have this liquid, right? You see where I'm going with this? You can keep doing this, and you end up here, right? We end up our last bit almost last bit of solid will have this chemistry, and then the very last liquid to solidify will be of the eutectic chemistry. And so we will form the theta phase in this ALCU system. All right, so what we just did by hand is the Schiele equation, right? So if we were to trace the composition of the solid on a graph as we did that process as we solidify a little bit of solid, some fraction solid each time. We start at k times c naught, which is k is the partition coefficient. It's related to the slope of this line. So we'll start basically here. Uh, and we would enrich, 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 enrich. And then at some point, all of a sudden, we form eutectic, right? And so this is the, if, if this is copper content on that y-axis, this would be 35 mass percent copper, right? right? And there would be some amount of eutectic at the end, right? And then solidification would be done. So fraction solid would be one, right? That's a one, doesn't look like it, right? So that's the Schiele equation. So to do the derivation, which we definitely don't have time for, um, you do a mass balance between some D F of S and the fraction liquid, uh, chemistry change and you get the Schiele equation, okay? And what that looks like when you calculate uh, in a multi-component system is you can get curves that look like this. You can get the mole fraction of solid, which is that fraction solid we just, we just used in our derivation versus temperature or versus chemistry. So you can look at the segregation of elements across let's say a hypothetical dendrite, a lot of times people will equate the mole fraction solid with the dendrite. So the core of the dendrite 
is mole fraction solid zero and the boundary of the dendrite is mole fraction solid one. And so you can see the solidification path, what eutectic phases or paratectic phases may form, the chemistry of those phases, the segregation profile, so you can compare with like an EDS line scan, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and this was all independent of cooling rate, it's just based on those assumptions we made at the very beginning, right? Okay, so what does that got to do with solidification cracking? Uh, recall that I said most of the theories deal with the nature of the last liquid to solidify. And so if we consider that instead of temperature, we say that this is distance. So let's say that temperature is proportional to distance, which is also reasonable. And I already said that fraction solid can be related to dendrite core. So that can also be a distance. We have a distance versus distance plot. The Scheil curve is really a cross section of what those dendrites look like as they're solidifying. And so the shape of the Scheil dictates what the last liquid to solidify looks like. Uh, and there are a bunch of models that use the Scheil to predict solidification crack kind of susceptibility by saying something about the shape or the slope of the Scheil near fraction solid equals one. Okay. And one of those models is called the Klein and Davies model, and that's what's implemented into Thermocalc uh, so that you can calculate kind of a crack susceptibility uh, for any material chemistry. And so real quick here, let's see how chemistry um, affects the susceptibility for silvication cracking for aluminum copper alloys. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the tool. And I'm going to click new project and say, don't save. That's going to clear this all out. What we're going to do is click property model calculation. And in this example, we're going to change the database. So we're going to choose the AL demo, aluminum demo database. And we'll click aluminum and copper. And now we'll go to the property model calculator page and here are some of the other properties we've been working on implementing into thermocalc. So there's things like interfacial energy, spinodal decomposition, martensite, bainite, things like that that I mentioned before. We're going to click on crack susceptibility coefficient. So you get this check mark here. If you read the Klein and Davies paper, you'll see that there are some parameters that you get to change. I don't have time to cover those, unfortunately. Um, what we're going to do is just do a one axis calculation. We're going to take the defaults on all of these, uh, which actually is nice because he did his work on aluminum alloys, I think. So these parameters are calibrated for aluminum already. And what we're going to change is the chemistry. We want to know the crack susceptibility coefficient as a function of copper from, say, 0 to um, 10 weight percent copper. And we'll do 10 steps. So what that's going to do, I'm going to click perform tree because this takes a few minutes to run. That's going to do a trial calculation for each copper content from zero to 10 for this aluminum copper system. And if we wanted to add a third element like silicon to see the effect of that, we could have done that. I'm not going to just in the interest of time, but I encourage you to do that on your own. After this is finished, clone the tree just like we did before and throw in silicon put two weight percent silicon or whatever you want to be, to be honest, uh, and then vary the copper again with that fixed amount of silicon and see how that impacts the silvication crack susceptibility. Um, it's interesting. Okay, so this runs a trial for each of these 10 chemistries between the min and the max, and then applies the Klein and Davies uh, silvication crack susceptibility model with these parameters uh, to give you the crack susceptibility coefficient. And this is pretty classic of aluminum alloys. You see a peak of susceptibility at some intermediate level of solute. Here it's about two weight percent copper and then a drop off. And why is there a drop off? Because we run into a phenomenon called uh, eutectic healing or crack healing where we get so much eutectic forming that there's plenty of liquid left at the end of solidification to kind of fill in uh, cracks that form or any gaps and uh, and avoid avoid cracking. But it's a balance of properties, right? If you have too much eutectic, uh, you might have bad mechanical properties, right? So 
you got to always balance things like weldability, castability, and, and mechanical properties. Okay, so I encourage you to play with this one a little bit more uh, on your own. Okay, I just have three slides left, so we'll try to wrap these up so we leave a little bit of time for questions. Now I just want to cover another case study uh, related to an ICME framework. And this is for an additive manufacturing build um, and some researchers at NIST, Keller and others, uh, were trying to model a, make a finite element model for an alloy 625 powder bed fusion. And so they have this, this model here, the laser is traveling this way. They wanna know the thermal distribution. They also wanted to make a phase field model where they explored the uh, actual dendrite arm spacing. So they wanted to calculate the dendrite arm spacing as well as a segregation profile. And so to, to start out, start out, they first needed to understand things like the thermal gradient and the solidification rate. Because to make a phase field model, you need to know something about the liquid solid interface velocity. And you also need to know something about the thermal gradients. So they need to find those things out. We can get those using a finite element model. And so what they do is they took data just like we saw in that very first example with the uh, specific heat and uh, latent heat. They took those values from a Shio calculation. So they actually captured the non-equilibrium solidification behavior and used those as inputs to an abacus model. Then they can determine the pool shape. And then from the pool shape, they can get the solidification speed because the solidification velocity is not simply the laser velocity. It's the speed of this trailing edge of the weld pool. So this angle of this weld pool at the back end matters for the velocity. And so it's the laser speed times the cosine of this angle. And so to get this angle, they needed this model. That model uses some data from thermocalc. Those get put into the phase field simulation um, and they were able to predict the dendrite arm spacing with reasonable accuracy. And this is really an ICME case study, right? We're taking different kinds of models and combining them together to understand a lot about a particular process or system. And so we take data from CALFAD, such as density, specific heat, enthalpy, goes into a finite element. We get out things like gradient solidification rate. Those go into a phase field. Phase field also needs things like Gibbs energy curves and mobility data to understand diffusion and driving force. And so CALFAD is also a, a driver for, for phase field models too. So it's a nice kind of trifecta of, of modeling. I think it's a really nice example for real ICME being used. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, you know, material science is complex. I covered a lot of topics in a very, very short amount of time and a lot of mechanisms, I think, most thing I want to say here is a lot of mechanisms are different for different materials, right? Strengthening mechanisms are not the same for steels as they are for aluminum. And so when we're trying to make models for everything, we still need talented people to make decisions, I think. We're not quite at the stage where we can just use machine learning and AI for everything. Um, and to get talented people, we need to educate them, right? And so education is critical. And I think CalFAD tools can play an important role in education because they might be what you use when you go out in industry and get a job. Um, and just to comment also on moving forward, I think for, for more ICME kind of frameworks, we need to, we need to make more property models in, in a CalFAD like way so that we can really capture the composition temperature dependence and, and, you know, understand how materials behave. So with that, I will wrap up and we have, almost 10 minutes for questions. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, Adam. Uh, this was a terrific seminar. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it and I have a lot of ideas uh, for how I can use this in, in my courses. So th really, thanks. Uh, there's two questions I think that have not been answered that maybe um, you can address one is does thermocalc read in asm phase diagram databases the answer to that is no um, to generate the phase diagrams um, we may use some of the same sources of data that the asm phase diagram center uses um, but when we're making a calfat database 
the phase data is not enough. We also need the energy data. So we need to know something about like the specific heat or the activity. And so we have to do experiments or get data from experiments like calimetry or DS, you know, DSC or DTA type experiments to understand, uh, you know, the energy involved in the phase transformation, not just phase boundary data. Uh, are there any uh, non-proprietary um, databases that can be read in, in Thermocalc? Yes, I don't know if they work with the academic version. Certainly for NanoHub, you would have to like load them, like upload them, and that's something we can explore outside of this. Uh, but there are some NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, has a repository um, that you can find. I don't know the link off the top of my head, but they have a couple of free databases that are that are like public that you can access. Yeah, many participants might have uh, their own license, right, for thermocalc, so they, they should be able to do that. Right, yeah. Also, people publish assessments, so you can go into like a journal, like the CalFAD journal, and a lot of times they the authors will make their TDB file, that's the database file, like available with their publication. Right. Perfect. So last question, I think. Um, how do we take into account the size effect, uh, for example, nanoparticles using CalFAD? Yeah, I think at the moment there's not an explicit model or way to, to do that. Um, the way I would do it is to just add or subtract some Gibbs energy to compensate for the 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 surface effect, right? That the nanoparticle stability is different than the equilibrium stability because of this surface area, right? Is like so small, is so high relative to the volume. And so that perturbs, you can think of it as like perturbing the Gibbs energy curve. Um, and so you could just, you know, add or subtract some Gibbs energy from the calculation. And there are ways to do that in the software. I didn't show any of that, but yeah. So Adam, there's two there are two questions related to whether CalFAT can be used for ceramics. You know, the, these typical examples are in metals. How about ceramics? Yeah, there is a database for ceramics, and I think, take a gamble here, I think that you can access the Oxide demo database. Yes, yeah, so we have an Oxide database, and uh, you can make these kind of like Oxide ternary diagrams. I'm really bad at this, but you can change the components. So we don't have to define our chemistry with just elements like weight percent of aluminum, weight percent of calcium. We can say, I have a certain amount of Al2O3 and I have a certain amount of calcium oxide. And you can define those as mass percents or, or mole percents, uh, atomic fraction, and make a calculation that way. So yes, it is possible. You can also change like the activity of oxygen. So if you have a an oxide system or even a metal system and you want to understand the oxidation behavior, you can that one of the parameters that you vary can be oxygen partial pressure, right? Or activity of oxygen. And you can see at a high at a certain temperature, you know, what oxides might be stable as a function of oxygen partial pressure, for example. Good. A few more questions. We have a few more minutes. Um, lots of questions. Very good discussion and lots of congratulations, Adam, uh, Adam by the way. So the question is, as uh, you showed in slides, a thermocal can provide data such as Gibbs energy to phase field simulations. Can you give some information about if this can, is the, if this is something that the academic tool can output. The, so the easiest way is to be used in, in phase field simulations. Yeah, the academic tool should be able to output that for the systems which are available, right? And with the understanding that the limitations of the databases. Yeah. Um, it's probably not the best way. Uh, the, the better way would be to use a, like one of our APIs. So there's right. some like hooks, right? So you can kind of integrate them more closely 
but you can make, I didn't show, if, if you made a calculation like we did before, you can make a table renderer. And that will let you output things, like here's the Gibbs energy. So you can output the Gibbs energy for a calculation and it'll make like an Excel, like a, like a normal right. table over here, which you can copy and paste into Excel or some other, some other system. So that is something that you can, that you can output. And, and one thing we should discuss, Adam, in the future, for the future is the, the Python API is very powerful. And so we should discuss whether we can do something like that within the restrictions of the academic databases. But I think a lot of people would enjoy having access to that. Maybe we can squeeze yeah. in one more question. And remember, the rest of the questions are going to be in the forum. And Adam uh, will will try to answer. There is a, a few questions left. And the question is uh, to get a full picture of all faces known in a, in a face space, are we supposed to use multiple databases for a calculation or is one sufficient? That's a tough question to answer. I think for most of the kind of commercial databases that we, that we license uh, and develop, uh, they're kind of all under constant development. As long as, you know, you're using the kind of database for the alloy that you have, like if you have an aluminum alloy and you use the aluminum database, I would say you don't need to add another database. It's kind of complicated to combine databases. We probably can't cover all the nuances of that uh, in, in a minute here, but generally, no, I would say you, you don't want to be combining databases. Um, but if you just need a phase, like a line compound, that's missing out of a database that you have, you can combine databases for that. That's a very common thing to do. Perfect. Where it's 2 p.m. Um, let's uh, stop here and let's thank Adam again for a terrific job. And um, we will put all the questions in the forum and I'm going to um, ask Adam if he be so kind as to log in at some point and answer some of the questions. And, and if, if, you know, as a community, uh, we can have Q&A, right? Others might know the, the, the answer to the question. So if you know the answer, if you have experience, chime in. That's the whole point of the forum, right? This is not um, Adam or Thermocal talking to you, but having really a, a forum for interesting discussions for the community, like examples. You know, I use these for teaching. I, I would love to hear those type of things. And uh, you can all share it in the group and, and these things can be published in Nanohub. So thanks. Thanks uh, very much, Adam, and thanks everyone for participating, and thanks, Aaron, for organizing and recording this.